if somebody actually wants to change, wants to actually vote those issues, they're going to vote for me. We need to be building up and fortifying our democratic institutions. You can tell what the Constitution was written for. It was written for at the time when it's in. Welcome to the Curators Podcast, a place for the Kennedy curious. And welcome, everybody. This is the Curators Podcast. Uh, I'm Paul, here with my co-hosts, Jacqueline and Aaron, and our special guest this evening, Karen Laurie. We are the wide awake. We are the non-programmable. And we are supporters of Robert F. Kennedy, the independent candidate for president in the United States. Uh, And we will spend some time explaining why we believe that he is a truly transformational figure in American politics and why he deserves to be the 47th president of this great nation. Uh, Karen, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate uh, it. Yes. And I'll, uh, if you'll allow me, I'll just I, I, let those who might not, may not know about you, I will just read a couple of things here. Uh, you you in your in your life today show many many people how to have body subconscious mind and conscious mind all aligned with what you want so that you can win in all areas of your life Uh, you studied mind body science at the university of california and then became an actress Uh, now act acting was the perfect petri dish for you uh, to put that mind body science into action after having done that over a thousand hours of television and film, and you can talk about that if you'd like, uh, you discovered how much power we have over our own physiologies and lives and put that knowledge into use, helping thousands of people transform. Very impressive. Uh, you are also an international best-selling author of three books, including Chronic Pleasure, Effortless Enchantment, and Chronic Pleasure in Relationships. Uh, your work has been endorsed by Deepak Chopra, Bruce Lipton, Gay Hendricks, and many, many more. Bruce Lipton said, you are an antidote to the pain of today's world of personal and global chaos. Wow. And uh, Deepak Chopra said that Karen Laurie's love radiates to you. You can trust that Karen is the real deal. She embodies chronic pleasure and teaches you to do the same. And... Uh, I will tell you guys that uh, I don't know Karen that well. We met on Zoom a number of months ago at a Bobby Kennedy event online, and we've communicated a little bit since. And I've been following you, Karen, on Twitter, and I just get the strong sense that every word I just read is is so true about you. Mm -hmm. And it does not surprise me that uh, your alignment in this political race is with Bobby Kennedy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, And, and, you know, we have several things we're going to be talking about this evening, including, uh, you know, some of the issues of perhaps of censorship and the the way mainstream media portrays our candidate. Uh, We also are going to talk about regenerative farming and the need for that and why Bobby is the uh, the one man who's capable of getting that done or setting the ship in the right direction, right? Um, how would you like to start this evening? Any particular uh, thing on your mind? Oh, no, I'm whatever you want to start with. Let's do regenerative farming because that's something I've studied and I like it. Uh-huh. Good, good. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I will show uh, a, a screen here. Uh, it's just take me a second to get up. I, uh, and it... <sighs> It's a little disturbing, guys. You can see that chart, right? Yeah. I think I think Aaron and uh, Jacqueline have seen this before. Uh, starting at age 25, what is the expected lifespan of an American citizen? Well, you can see in the United States, the two red lines, orange lines are depicted there, one with a college degree and one without a college degree. And notice how the average lifespan of a, of a U.S. citizen without a college degree has plummeted in just the last several years. Uh, if we add tw- the age of 25 to that number, we'll see that the average person is, is dying shy of age 75 now if, if they don't have a college degree. And what's also noteworthy here is that other countries have not experienced this, right? The gray lines there represent... Uh, the industrialized world. Now, this is a study from The Economist in conjunction with the Kaiser Foundation. 
And we, we know that this has been a trend underway. And one of our, one of our team members, Johnny Paradise, you, I don't know if you know him, Karen, but he talks about how uh, glyphosate is being sprayed uh, in, uh, on the fields and three pounds per person per year. Um, we know for a fact that glyphosate is carcinogenic. Um, have you, has your work led you to, uh, in, in that area at all? Yeah, well, glyphosate, you know, basically kills all bacteria. So it's a broad spectrum antibiotic, which can lower the health of everybody who eats food that is made with glyphosate and a lot of food, even organic, sometimes that organic gets a drift of the glyphosate because they, they spray it with a plane, you know, and it just goes everywhere and they really douse GMO food with glyphosate because it's glyphosate resistant. I mean, or so that everything dies except for the plant that they're that they're spraying on it. All the green around it dies. Um, and glyphosate also, yes, exactly. And yep, glyphosate there it is. Also, um, has been linked with non-Hodgkin's disease. And Robert Kennedy and his team have uh, gotten, I think, two point two billion dollars for about forty thousand home gardeners because the gardeners were using glyphosate because on the picture of the glyphosate, it's a guy in, you know, shorts and bare feet and a bare top spraying. Mm -hmm. And it causes um, non-Hodgkin's lesions all over the body. And it's not good. And it's also, um, <laughs> it's also, it also, you know, the soil has a microbiome and the microbiome in the soil is what is part of what gives us our nutrients. The soil gives us our nutrients, but you need the microbiome for the soil to be alive. And just like we need our microbiome to be alive and glyphosate kills the microbiome in the soil. And one of the things it does is it, when you have healthy soil, the soil sequesters water and, and carbon. So it sequesters water. So then when there's a drought, it doesn't affect that soil as much as it might. And when you have dead soil, it has nothing to hold it together. There's none of these little sponges of water or carbon or anything to hold it together. And so you get all this topsoil loss that goes into the ocean. And I love the ocean and it's, and it's a toxic topsoil that is going out into the ocean and causing big dead spots in the ocean. Like I think off the coast of, Texas, I think there's a dead spot that comes from uh, farming, conventional farming, where the topsoil has, you know, been pushed out by the wind or the rain. So, uh -huh. so it's so it's so fascinating to me to uh, look to see about regenerative farming. And have you guys talked about regenerative farming before? Because I, I just yeah, we have. somewhat, somewhat. Jacqueline, you have your uh, you, you have a, a special thing going with Victory Gardens. Yes. Um, so it, it, it was actually a, it, I don't remember my dreams much, but for some reason I remembered this dream. Uh, I woke up and I just kind of it came to me that a great um, we could create a beautiful garden path to the White House for, you know, Robert Kennedy with um with gardens all around the country. So um, the Victory Garden, for anybody that doesn't know this, is is that it started in a World War One and carried over into World War Two to produce uh, food in abundance to help uh, support the war. And they were shipping so much of the food uh, abroad to, to support the, the war effort out there. And then the people on the ground were actually hungry they were starving. So it was a positive um, government effort that they used marketing and campaigning and, and uh, different programs to start these victory gardens all over the country. And they did. And it was, um, I mean, it really is amazing. These people were, were they, they were growing um, 
sustainable they were sustaining themselves with food out of their front yard their backyards their schoolyards their every piece of land that they could really find they were just springing up these gardens and it was home gardeners and farmers and every it, i mean it's just such a beautiful thing and then um after world war ii it started to trickle uh, away uh partly because um i guess the push wasn't so much but also because we had uh, the boomer a generation where we had such an abundance of, um, uh, you know, in in our population, and uh, the capitalism took over as far as in a um, you know the crony capitalism after some time took over to industrialize the agriculture, and this is where we are today. Now there have been many efforts to kind of revive the the Victory Garden and, and many uh, successful ones. But I think that this is the perfect opportunity for us to let's do it. Let's do it across the country. I think anybody can do it. You can do it with a, your own one pot, uh, a farm, uh, a regenerative farm, uh, which is great to bring awareness to that. And in your backyard, front yard, I, I just think that this is the perfect time for us to do this. It is great for your mental health. It's great for your um you know, helps with people who are struggling with addiction. Um, it's proven to uh, help with recidivism if they're helping people, um, you know, who have been incarcerated while they're incarcerated and even when they're out learning how to nurture something and giving their love to, to the earth. Yes. And, and seniors, I mean, it's just limitless of what we could do with this. And uh, so I'm trying to spread the word out and uh, it's starting to happen. I love it. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and uh, Karen, uh, Aaron was telling us about his cousin a couple of weeks ago uh, as it relates to uh, the issue of uh, glyphosate and uh, how that was working in, in uh, his, his uh farming community near him but aaron i, I don't want to force you into telling that story again <laughs> well, well there's a couple of things i wanted to talk karen uh, just about generally so that story is kind of interesting my cousin is a farmer he's in alberta so he's north of us quite a ways i'm in colorado so he's, he's north of us but every winter you know it's inevitable in alberta that it's going to the weather is very unpredictable by the time we get to harvest or by the time they get to harvest so it's not uncommon for them at all to basically take the tractors out on regular wheat and spray the whole thing in order to shock the crop in order to grow it, you know, to get it to harvest before the storms come. Mm. And they do that year after year. And I said to him, you know, what do you, how do you clean that off? I mean, you're spraying poison on everything. And he said, well, it, it, you know, that's, that's on the outside of the kernel. And I, I thought, well, that's all going to get milled up and ground up into the stuff. And I, I don't think there's any, um, surprise that there's a correlation between celiac disease and glyphosate and Roundup use, that both of those things have really gone exponential since those crops, both GMO stuff started being able to use Roundup as much as you, you know, as much as you wanted on the, on the crop itself. Plus that sort of practice, which is not uncommon. Um, Alberta is a huge, huge community of growing wheat um, all across for all across the world. And, and they, uh, they clearly are doing something like that. But the the question I was going to ask you um, was related some somewhat between uh, your life as an actress and and this whole topic. One of my favorite movies is The Biggest Little Farm. Which oh yeah, I love it. It's a great movie, and it's really very very fun to talk uh, to see the difference between somebody who took the time to do it right and then tried to listen to the land and see what was going to happen and then sort of adapt their practices to it. Do you, um, as you kind of st have studied this, how practical is this? Because one of the arguments that my cousin who sprays his stuff all over the time, you know, he says, well, industrialized farming is the only way to go because that's, uh, we would never be able to feed the world without doing that. So what, when you've studied this, what, what are your thoughts in relationship to, if everybody did sort of the biggest little farm compared to this industrialized agriculture, how would we do it? Okay, well, let me tell you before how we would do it, because it's it's really individual to everybody's location, what they're wanting to grow, their soil type. So it's very individual. But regarding the biggest little farm, I got to meet the farmer. He, oh, did you? 
Yeah, because it was up for an award, and as an actress, you get to go to movies, sure. so I went. And um, and he said this was so fascinating. We had a lot of fires a couple of years ago, and he's not he's about forty miles away from us. So there were fires, like the whole sky was, you know, black. Yeah. And um, what he said is because this was now after the movie had been made, right? So he's showing the movie, but now this fire had happened in between the movie being made and him talking. And what he said is, when the fires came. All the farms around him, which were conventional farms, yep, got burnt. Their crops got burnt. The farm, a lot of the farmland got burnt. Their soil had water. They didn't get burnt. It's crazy. Then all those farms lost a two foot of topsoil because there was big rains afterwards. So they lost two foot of top topsoil, and then his farm didn't lose any because everything was planted. Everything had green on it, and. Um, I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All these conventional farmers were telling him that after that happened, when they saw that his farm was fine, the farm, the, the fire didn't get on the farm. The fire couldn't go. I mean, I guess if there had been a spark that went as far as his farm, but I think he has a pretty large farm. Yeah. Um, or they have a pretty large farm. Um, the, just nothing, nothing happened. And then they had with all the rainwater, they also had built a, um, I forget what it's called, but it's where the water stays underground. A cistern type of thing. Yeah, it was a cistern, but it was not really a cistern, but it was a whole a whole underground water oh, thing. Maybe it's called a cistern. Yeah. yeah, aquifer, something like that. Yeah. And so so then when there was the drought after the rains, his farm didn't get the drought. So his uh, neighbors were all coming over. Can you show us what to do? Can you show us what to do? Uh, Can you show us what to do? So it really is cool. And then um, Dr. Elaine Ingham, she runs something called Soil Food Web. She has helped somebody. Um, she's helped people transition. And one of the things that's so cool is when you transition to a farm that's regenerative, you don't need, um, if you have cows or animals, any kind of animals, you don't need uh, tractors. You don't need to till because the cow or the whatever, the pigs, the chickens, whoever is there, they will they will be walking on the soil and the soil will get tilled, it will get turned over. And the tractors, they don't need them. They use drones to put in compost tea so that instead of sending pollution, they're sending, that's, sending something that's made from usually um, hopefully organic food waste and leaves sure. and things like that. And so that goes over there and she's helped with people that have done over um, 17,000 acres. So that's, that's not huge, but it's pretty big. And then Dee Dee Pierce house, she has worked in Uttar Pradesh in India where she taught, they have a lot of women, they had this big, huge women, um, group and the women were growing food but they were growing it conventionally so she taught them how to grow regenerative food and to use the cows they don't they don't kill cows right. there, but to use the cows for tilling and for also apparently cow urine is very good for crops i don't know um <laughs> that's what she said but she got well, 700 yeah, urea in there and that's used yeah. in in fertilizer right so that, okay. that would make sense yeah okay cool thanks so um so with her, she taught 700,000 women farms and then other states in India started adopting it. And now the people who first learned it in India are teaching farmers in Africa. Wow. So, you know, so she's she's doing a huge scale. And then what happens is the people are, you know, the diabetes is going away. The celiac disease is going away. The cancers are going away. There's so many okay. things that happen when you do regenerative I like organic, biodynamic, yep. permaculture, any of those things. I was once in Costa Rica and I went, there's these beautiful red kind of flowers everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, I went into a restaurant and it was kind of an indoor outdoor restaurant and the flowers were huge. And everything that they cooked there that I was eating was like huge, and you know, all the vegetables. And um, I said, why is your, why are your flowers and your food so big? What happened to you guys? And they said, it's permaculture. And I said, oh, and they told me, they told me all about what they had been doing, where they 
plant this plant next to this plant because this plant and this plant are symbiotic and they do something in the soil to make them grow together. And so it was so cool. You know, I just, I just love all that stuff. And I think if we did it in a, in a proportion, you know, if, if enough American farmers wanted to do regenerative organic farming, I think our whole culture, one thing, our, our ocean wouldn't be so acidic because the farm stuff that goes into the ocean makes it very acidic and that kills a lot of our ecosystem in our, in our ocean. I sailed to Hawaii when I was 18, so I have this thing for the ocean, okay? <laughs> um, but um, also, the, you know, like I said, the soil, if the soil is not, doesn't have its microbiome. So what's fascinating is we have microbiome on our skin. We have microbiome in our eyes, in our ears, probably in our brain, for sure, in our sex organs. Um, we have microbiome in our gut. We have microbiome in the soil. We have microbiome in plants. All plants have microbiome. Unless they're unless they're conventionally grown with a lot of chemicals, um, but normal plants that are just growing, they have a microbiome. And tree, the way we get rain, unless they're doing it in a fake way with the planes, the way we get rain <laughs> is that the trees make their microbiome goes up, up, up into the atmosphere, and then their microbiome, the bacteria in their microbiome, attaches to water molecules and makes them heavy enough to come down. Fall back down. Yeah. I mean, like when yeah. you think about the brilliance of nature, it's off the charts. Nature is it off really is. What we've been doing is we've been making nature a slave. And there's this great guy, Joel Salatin, and he says, he says what most people, what most farmers want to do is they want to, um, I'm, I'm going to misquote him. I'm sorry, Joel, I love you. Um, they were going to do this. Um, he said, most farmers want to just take nature down and just have their way with her. He said, I like to caress nature. And he has a regenerative farm. It's called Polyface Farms. He said, I like to caress nature. I like to nurture nature. And then nature gives me abundance. And during the pandemic, when there was no, um, you know, not that much traffic, Joel was telling me that, because I interviewed him on my show. I have a show called Stories We Love. So Joel, Joel told me that people came to his farm and said, wait, you're, you're, steak is so much cheaper it's cheaper than it is at costco and he said oh and they said how could that be and he said well i don't have to buy seeds i don't have to buy a tractor right i don't have to buy a till i don't have to buy pesticides i don't have to buy fertilizer my cows and my pigs and my chickens make it and so you know so he was really doing well during thing he wrote a book called um Everything I want to do is illegal. <laughs> He's awesome. He was just on uh, Bobby's podcast the other day. Yeah. It? Yeah. 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 I interviewed yeah. him a couple of while ago and Bobby interviewed him a long time ago too. So he's, yeah. he knows Bobby. I think, I think he'd be great to be in our, if Bobby, you um, know, in, in a cabinet with Bobby oh, or yeah. you know, secretary of agriculture or something, you know, and make everything that he wants to do. <laughs> legal. <Yeah>. Legal. <laughs> Yeah, that's such a great so, friend of his. I, everything I want to do is yeah. illegal. <laughs> right. Is is, na is nature illegal now, too? Or <laughs> it, I saw this video, and it might have been cropped. I'm sorry if it's not an accurate video, but it was Bill Gates saying, and again, it could be like a fake video, but he was saying, like, what, you know, all these people, they want to plant trees. I mean. Oh, yeah, that's a real, he, I heard, I saw the same thing. It's crazy. Like, and he said, that's so stupid. That's just bunk. And I'm like, no, it's not. We need trees, you know, and there's another guy, John Liu, and he creates green in deserts. Um, he took China, had an area that was just sand and he, he did regenerative, not just farming, but regenerative planting, like biodynamic planting. And he had all the different levels. So the grasses, the bushes, the, uh, trees and he he reforests um, lots of places and you need the trees or you don't or you'll get drought like I said because you need the trees and we're cutting down trees we're clear cutting trees I always buy recycled things as best I can you know so recycled uh -huh. you know bath towels or not bath towels um wash cloth what what are they paper towels recycled paper towels. Paper towels, yeah <laughs> recycled yeah. Paper towels, everything i can that's recycled because i and even when i buy journals because i write a lot in a journal 
I, um, for those of you who forgot how to write, it's really good to learn it because it's so good for you. Um, but, um, or never learned how to write in school. Um, but with journals, I get recycled paper journals as much as I can too. So, I, cause I just don't want to keep cutting down trees. And, um, yeah, so there's a right. lot of people out there who are doing really good work and really changing. There was another guy who did regenerative farming on a house in Malibu and the fires went into Malibu and his, his house was fine. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, th thank you for that. And when you were talking, Karen, I, the word abundant came to my mind when you were talking about nature and then you spoke the word. And isn't it funny how, yes, nature does offer us all abundance. It's so true. And yet the human motive and Jacqueline touched on it before and what is capitalism. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, because this all filters into this conversation, I want to share the screen uh, to tie it into the candidate a little bit. This is a uh, snapshot of a video that that Bobby did last year with American farmers. Uh, Elizabeth Kucinich was on the video with him. And this is on Rumble still. And I strongly advise anyone in our audience to uh, to check this out to get a sense of his personal and unique commitment to this issue. The uh, uh, so so we have this uh, group called the Falconer on uh, People for Kennedy on our grassroots movement, and we have many authors from different backgrounds and so forth. And there's one woman; her name is Elizabeth uh, Grazer uh, Lindsay. That's her name, and she's a farmer from Salem, Oregon. And she wrote this uh, wonderful article that talks about farming in her area. She talks about, and I'll just read this here because you guys know about this. Uh, he helped to litigate $289 million win against Monsanto. That was just one item as well. Right, it goes uh, up to 2.2, I think. 2.2 billion, exactly. Right. And, and here's the part that she writes about. And again, we probably know this, but she goes into detail. She has personal experience with this. Uh, how mega corporations consolidate the agricultural industry, reducing competition, dropping prices below the cost of production, and controlling farm practices. Uh, and this is now a quote from Bobby, how Smithfield dropped the price of pork from 60 cents a pound to two cents a pound. It put out of business 28,000 independent hog farmers. This was in North Carolina and it replaced them with 2,200 factories, all of them either owned by Smithfield or contracted to Smithfield. The farmers lose all control. Smithfield dictates all of their farming practices. They control 80% of hog production in North Carolina. They dropped the prices. Now other states like Iowa had to adopt the same system. They end up taking control of 80% of hog production in our country, Smithfield does. And what do they do then? They sell themselves to the Chinese, uh, to a Chinese company. And one of the, one of the uh, really important uh, concepts that, that uh, Bobby talks about, and I don't think it gets enough attention, and that is that capitalism, in his words, needs to be harnessed to a social purpose. And when we, when we con convert capitalism, which we had at one time in this country, I'm 65 years old, I remember capitalism, but we've gone into this world of financialization and we have done what I call, uh, we've turned Bedford Falls, Karen, into Pottersville in this country. And this Smithfield example is, is, is a perfect case in point. And there are many others uh, where they basically are bastardizing and feudalizing the public uh, in order to garner more, extract more profit for themselves. And, uh, you know, it, apparently Gordon Gecko said greed was good, right? Well, apparently uh, somebody took that as a mantra in, in the halls of these, uh, these institutions, you know? Well, you know what's so interesting is that if you read like the corporation bylaws, there are only two things are to make a profit uh -huh. and pay their shareholders. They don't have anything right. about um, taking care of the earth or taking care of people. So the corporations are kind of psychopathic in that sense. I mean, there are good corporations. I'm not saying all of them are, but the way that they're, that they're, that they're constructed legally is that they have to make their, their shareholders money. So that's a tricky thing there, but I love what Bobby talks about 
um, when he says he wants to end subsidies, part of the reason Smithfield could do that is because they get subsidized. Right. And when you have Smithfield su subsidized or when you have Monsanto subsidized or when you have a pharmaceutical company subsidized or when you have oil companies subsidized, there's no true free market capitalism. So we can't actually. Exactly. Yeah. So we can't actually know like they probably if they weren't subsidized, they probably couldn't have dropped their their thing to two cents a, a, a pound. That's just that just doesn't make sense. But if you have it, yeah. real capitalism, it could be it could restore us. And because of lobby efforts and you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It, it becomes they they privatize the gains and they socialize the losses. That is not capitalism. <laughs> Right. That sounds a, a little bit more like, uh, you know, kleptocracy. And I think Bobby uses that word as well, corporate kleptocracy. Uh, Meaning you know, corporations are stealing from us in case people don't know that word, because not everybody. It's a made up word. That's right. That's right. And it's <laughs> it's it's a it's a confiscation scheme. And I know, Aaron, you've you've talked a little bit about this, too, where they they, they the government is kind of the middleman. Yeah. And they they print these trillions and trillions of dollars, which they've now amassed up to 34 point something trillion. They're actually incurring a trillion dollars of debt every 100 days. It's untenable as it is incomprehensible. And yet, where did that money go? That's a burden that's being placed on future generations, our yes. children, our grandchildren, and frankly, on us too. But but I'm more worried about my family and my, my children and my grandchildren and the burden that they're going to bear. And, and the fact that they've been essentially, uh, f f as I said before, feudalized and being turned more into chattel and guinea pigs than, than to be able to, earn, to, to enjoy the fruits of their own labor. Their labor will be paying for the riches derived by Smithfield Foods and by Monsanto for for extracting the wealth out of the system at the expense of uh, and and again using the government as the middleman uh to 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 send that wealth over there and so the system has gotten deeply corrupted uh and the the amazing thing to me and i've said this before guys you know is that bobby kennedy is the one man he's done more for the average american and for americans in all walks of life than any human being I've ever known. Yeah. Is, is is there anyone else who's done more, who's fought the fight that he has, Jacqueline? I don't think so. How is, how is the conspiracy working against him that would have people think otherwise, that the one man who's there to fight for them is being labeled a conspiracist by the real conspirators? You know, <clears throat> I love that because it's so, you know, I've known Bobby 33 years. When I knew him, I was living in New York. I was doing a soap opera, which I only watched twice, but it was still. Funny. I still have good. Was that friends. that was one life to live, right? Yeah, yeah. But I had I have good friends from there still, and I love those people. But um, but when I was there, Bobby was cleaning up the Hudson River, and so he was suing Ford Motors and General Motors, who were just spewing their paint into the river. The the, the river is blue. He was suing uh, Penn Station, which was just spewing oil out into the river you know and i think that's where we get pen oil i'm not sure but um <laughs> but but he was suing all these people and because of that he had to sue the epa which was allowing them to do that so he started his whole uh environmental attorney business by suing the three letter agencies and some of the four like usda that's a four but dot fec um no, FCC, um, uh, the um, NIH, CDC, FDA. <laughs> I can't even think of all the agencies. Too many, Karen. <laughs> there are. I know. It's so. If many. it has three, if it has three letters in it, and it's in, inside the Beltway, you got it. <laughs> it's called alphabet soup, is what it's alphabet called, soup. <laughs> or alphabet sewage, more. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Yes. Go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so he really has this understanding of how those agencies work, who's corrupted in them. Because when you do a trial, you get discovery. And in discovery, you find out what the people that you're fighting against don't want you to know. 
So he right. gets to know what the EPA does not want you to know. He gets to know what the FCC doesn't want you to know. Right. So it's really fascinating. And he wins a huge amount, a huge percentage of his trials. I don't know what the percentage is, but he's won so many things. And I've seen it. And he's worked for Cree Indians. He's worked for the NAACP. He's he's just done so many things for so many people all over, you know, and fighting in the Amazon, fighting against, um, you know, like the Smith, the Smithfield thing. I don't think he sued them yet, but he probably would. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's just, he just looks to see, like he's suing the DOT for the um, Palestine, Ohio incident, which should have never happened yes. if they Correct. had done it correctly. If the government right. was captured, they would not have had that problem. Again, more money in the, in the, in the coffers of the rail company, mm -hmm. right? They could save some, some cost. Uh, but now it's the taxpayer that ends up footing the bill for that. Uh, and, uh, you know, Bobby himself has said many times that he, you know, you, you do what he does for a living and you get a PhD in how to unravel corporate capture, right? And I, I, I am pleading with people, please, please stop listening to the mainstream media and the rhetoric and the tribalism out there. Please, I'm begging you, go to, there's a, the, the, the website I have scrolled at the bottom there kennedy24.com about and you will learn about bobby kennedy and who he really is and if you if you want more you can go to this one uh there's that one and then there's this one kennedy24.com policies and you will learn exactly what he stands for and who he is and, and, and there's also tons of great videos on his site that are important. absolutely and yes the, indeed and the 34 trillion dollar debt they're working on that right now to find a solution that will be able to make it okay so that your kids don't have to bear the burden of that. I don't know exactly what the solution is, but I'm excited to find out. And uh, yeah. I wanted to say one thing, you know, you did a great post um, that we collaborated on, on a video thing. I, and I, I think we should probably put that in the notes, Paul. It's a, it's a really great um, post. It just kind of talks about a personal experience that Karen has just knowing Bobby and kind of walking through all of the stuff that she just talked about. And it's really fantastic to think that somebody out there, because I think that's really a, a huge piece of this campaign that's so compelling because we have, we've seen everybody from sort of the high minded politician with the perfect crease in their slacks to the wrecking ball and Trump and all of these different people, but none of them actually can figure this out because it's once they get there, there's too many, it's too, it's too complicated. There's too many people at the table. There's too many rules and regulations and you got to go up and down and all this, but it feels like uh, Bobby actually understands that better than anybody. And I, and Karen, you spoke to that really, really well. And I, I think it's, um, I'm glad you spoke about how long you've known him, but I, I think there's something there that you understand because you do have, you know, a closer relationship with him than some of us that you just get to see the sort of inner workings of a person and how exceptional of a character he is and how he applies that in this and what that would mean for a presidency in our country. Right, yeah, he's been fighting the establishment literally since I've known him and probably, and I think a few years before that, like 40 years, yeah. and I've only known him 33 or 34. And so um, he, he really gets it. And one of the things I like about him is that he doesn't need anything he said this in some he said this somewhere i can't remember where he said it but he said you know i don't need anything so they don't have anything on me i'm right. totally honest about everything i do and i've made a lot of mistakes he's not a saint you know i don't agree with everything he does but i agree with 95 percent of it but um but you know he said he said they, that nobody can really blackmail me because i i am honest and nobody can really corrupt me because I'm going to listen to what is right for the American people and what my, he didn't use the word spirit, but I'm going to say that, but what his, you know, what his own conscience and his, his divine connection talks about. And I think that's really key. In that, in that uh, video you're talking about, which we will put in the show notes, uh, Karen, your spirit comes across in that, you know, and it's beautifully spoken. Aaron, you did such a great job with that. So I will get that in the show notes. 
And, you know, you're touching on what I admire the most about Bobby Kennedy is his application of the principles of the character of the man. We did a whole segment on this uh, Mm -hmm. recently. And, you know, uh, Aaron, you talked about how Bobby kind of just by his nature, by his stature, invites people into their better selves. And I am a better man because of Bobby Kennedy. Mm -hmm. He has made me into a better man. I'm 65 years old. This is the first time I've ever said that in my life. Mm. Yeah, I've mentioned that before. That uh, about when he, uh, there's one of the videos where he talks about um, putting away the shopping cart, and now I can't because it's his job to put away the shopping cart, and I can't I, I I can't get it out of my head now. So I I put the shopping cart away, no matter how far away it is, or if it's raining, it's my job now. And that's that's due to him. So I mean, it's- Jacqueline, I know you, Jacqueline. You're not just putting your cart away. You're putting other people's carts away, too. <laughs> you know what else that I love it's about that is um, when I've hiked with Bobby, he picks up litter. I pick up litter. My mom had me picking up litter as a kid. And then Bobby picks up litter. And I was like, you pick up litter? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. So it was just so sweet because, you know, it's just, it's the part. And I said, why do you pick it up? And he said, well, I just believe you're supposed to do something good for people without any, without telling anybody about it. But he didn't say that I couldn't tell anybody about it. So I love that he picks up litter, you know, and he does it on the hike. And he also removes dangerous snakes from the hikes. He removes dog stuff from the hikes. He brings a shovel and a bucket. <laughs> yes yes and you know i saw him just the other day we put out a video from our grassroots movement about bobby handling a giant burmese tortoise which is a species that's 200 million years old they were walking the earth with the dinosaurs wow and he you know more than any other uh uh politician is there another polit is he even a politician i don't know but he he gets this whole concept of man's link with nature and the beauty of God and creation. And it, it, it doesn't have to be a religious concept. You know, it's it's just like you were saying before, Karen, the magnificence of, of how nature just kind of unfolds in this artistic beauty that we could never, you know, we could never uh, as humans improve upon, you know? Nature has innovation, creativity, diversity, Hmm. abundance, resilience. I mean, it has so many qualities that are so awe-inspiring. And, you know, just to be in nature, I live in nature, and to be in nature is so key for people because, you know, they've done all these studies. You go walk in the woods and you're going to feel better. You go down to the beach and you're going to feel better, right? Why? Because it's nature, and nature has magic to it. Nature, I mean, when you look at nature... You know, you one acorn can create a forest. Hmm. I mean, I have a milkweed. I'm now a milkweed, a butterfly way station because the milkweed has proliferated because it, every seed has a little parachute and they just fly all over. So I have, a, I have, I think you have to have nine. I have nine. So I get monarch butterflies that come here and they eat my milkweed. You and I both. You and yeah. I both. Yeah, I had the perimeter of my 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 yard. Uh, I planted one milkweed about four or five years ago, and I just it self propagates itself. But then I encourage it to do so. Exactly. And then, and then it like in the fall when it starts to make those little parachutes, I'll put it scatter it throughout my yard and let it come up. But then I'll also release it out beyond my yard, yes. hoping to to encourage it. And it, it and it it's I tell you my my I, I have the butterfly bushes parsley brings the blue uh, the the swallowtails so if you uh, plant parsley which you're gonna eat <laughs> and it, it, you know it's, I love it's parsley I eat <laughs> them. I'm a tabouli fan so um, and and use it constantly but I have it all over my yard all different strains of it and the swallowtail uh, uh, butterfly that's what it uh, feeds off of. Oh, thank you so much. I didn't know that. I don't know if we get swallowtails in California and Los Angeles, but I'll uh, I'll check it out if it's if it's native. I'll I'll do it. Butterflies yeah. amazing. Just to talk about butterflies for one second, butterflies fly. I'm not sure which direction they start in, but they go 
all the way, let's say from my house in Los Angeles to Canada and then down to Mexico. And then they come back and lay, they, they lay their babies here at my house. So if you like this, if you have kids, get milkweed. Kids love to watch it because you can see they lay their little, their little, um, they lay, they put themselves into a papoose or cocoon. I think it's a papoose. cocoon. Yeah. I think it's a papoose for a monarch, but maybe I'm wrong. You might be right. You know more. Um, <laughs> sounds like the two of you have another conversation coming. <laughs> but they put they, the little cocoon grows and then oh kids just go out every day to watch it and they get so excited and then when the butterfly's coming out the kids are screaming and doesn't scare the butterfly you know and the other thing that's cool is when a caterpillar goes into the cocoon before it becomes a butterfly it turns into imaginal cells Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's incredible. And that's and it's so transformative. And the milkweed, the reason why uh, we plant the milkweed is because this is the only plant that the caterpillars uh, from the monarch butterfly will feed off of. And, you know, it's it's dying out. So just because of the pesticides, because of the farming where they kill it. Right. Yeah. And the development as well. So it's just, you know, the strip malls that they're putting in and the roads that they're putting in. And it's just and and that's why it, actually I've, I've heard Bobby speak about having a, a highway monarch highway, which I know there's a lot of programs going on where they're uh, creating like the between the highways. They're putting like planting milkweed through that. And uh, he actually spoke about the butterflies in his announcement speech in April and really, really, it was quite moving. It really was. I mean, they're amazing. Nature's amazing. Yes, it is. Do, do you guys know about the San Padrignano model that Bobby has alluded to? It's a, for recovery centers oh, yes. based in Italy. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, you know, so, so he, he's identifying not just with nature, but the nature within us, mm -hmm. you know, and the healing that this country needs, because I'll tell you, there are people who, who will on November 5th, they will go into that voting booth in a tribal sense. Uh, you know, we, we talked about this, Karen, before I, I, I use the term rock'em sock'em robots. You have a, a red one and a blue one, and they're trying to knock each other's block off. And that's what's happening on media all day long, you know, the, depending on which channel you're listening to. And, uh, you know, they're going to go into the voting booth. And our goal is we're driving our bus down the center of Main Street, USA, and we're casting our net far and wide from the center and inviting people into this this big tent of hope and change and, uh, and and solutions. And so when they go into that voting booth on November 5th, they will have the courage to go for hope over fear. And mm -hmm. and this is this is the message. This is the work we have to do over the next several months. And especially, I think, over the next two to three months so that those numbers keep up. Bobby gets to go on the debate stage or gets to be covered in the mainstream media as he so deserves to be. And he can begin to debunk to America all of this uh, nonsense that's been portrayed about him, right? Isn't that what we're, what, we're, what we're hopeful to be able to do? Yes, and I also, I just think that the more that people hear Bobby directly, not on a news show where they're gonna edit it to make it look bad, but directly where they hear him, and that's why on 20, uh, Kennedy 2020, Kennedy24.com, if you go to the video section, you can also see him talking about anything that you're interested in. Probably you can just go and look and see what he says. He's got videos about housing for young people. He's got videos for these kind of uh, places for recovery. Like they want to do organic regenerative farms and bring people that are either, um, let's say, in prison, but who are, um, you know, not violent offenders, maybe for a drug thing or something. Um, put them into these and, and then also addicts and then probably veterans, you know, there's like so many people that could really benefit probably homeless too, that could go to these places, learn a skill and become able to be in nature and then learn how to get sober or get free of PTSD or learn how to meditate or whatever it is. But they're going to be in a place where it's a community of people that are 
caring for nature and they're going to discover that divinity of nature within them because we are nature we have the same we are nature <laughs> These I'm scrolling through these uh, videos, Karen, and there's mm -hmm. I think we're in the hundreds now and uh, you can even sort by topic. Yeah. Uh, so there's so many and uh, and and it just shows how how tireless this candidate is. He's just, a, uh, you know, I mean, he gets uh, it, and I made this joke. There's really only one of him. That's that's very hard for me to believe, you know. Uh, <laughs> But but there is, and uh, and he's so genuine, and I'm I'm so glad to hear that you've known him so long and and gotten to know him as well as you have because that's uh, that's an endorsement that that rings true here, you know. Um, I uh, I also put your information on the bottom of the screen, uh, just uh, for anyone who wants to access your uh, information. Is there any any? I know we can reach you on Twitter, uh, and. That's a that's a home run to anyone who wants information on Bobby. And just to get this sort of spiritual wake up call, I, I think Karen's Twitter feed is an amazing place to go. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with us on that, Karen, about yourself? Before I go to myself real quick, I'll just say when people do anything from fear, fear shuts off your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain where you make executive decisions. Fear starts to activate the part of your, the back of your brain where your primitive brain is, where you go into fight or flight or sex and, or freeze. And um, they're all F, F words. I just didn't use one F word. Um, and <laughs> when you're in a state of appreciation, when you're in a state of love, you make the right decision for you. And that's been my experience since I started to get on this path. I would love to give your readers uh, a link to my books so they can download them for free. They can go to chronic c-h-r-o-n-i-c pleasure p-l-e-a-s-u-r-e -E, book singular even though there's three there dot com chronic pleasure book dot com and um yeah i would love if you want to follow me on twitter i'll see if i can follow you and i appreciate you and thank you guys uh, i love how you know you are it's so and and, be, and before you go i'll just add if i may that uh, you know bobby had this traumatic experience at the age of 14 uh, as well as at nine with his uncle, but, you know, s suffering multiple traumas. You referred to PTSD before and the fight, flight, freeze response and the journey that Bobby took through his years of drug addiction, right? Well, I have a personal experience and, and these guys, you know, Jacqueline, especially I've shared with her in detail. Uh, I've, I've had that experience too, Karen. So I, I experienced uh, fight or flight and freeze. Uh, I had a trauma at the age of 14. And, and the reason I bring that up is because I see Bobby Kennedy as a, uh, a true genuine hero to have risen so majestically above the trauma as a Kennedy. Only a Kennedy can, I think, you know, but he, he was so high functioning through all of that time. And to, to then turn it around, to turn this addiction around and, 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 redirect his life to this noble purpose of public service uh it it's i i've never been drawn to anything like that in my life you mm, know that's beautiful yeah yeah i help people so, with ptsd just so you know in case that helps <laughs> i can help that, that is that is that is very good to know yeah. and it's uh yeah it's been it's been quite a journey for me uh, well, we, we could have that conversation another time but yeah yeah I yeah. used to have it too. It's, it's, I used to have a lot of that stuff. PTSD, bipolar, panic attacks, uh -huh. all gone. Yes, yes, yes. Your, your, your intro that I read earlier really does intrigue me. It really does. Mm. And uh, so you're, you're so kind to be with us and hopefully we'll have you back. <laughs> yeah, mm. thank you for asking me. It's so great and so great to see you guys and you just beautiful and smart and wonderful and thank you everyone who's listening i just appreciate you too thank you so much thank you thank you see you ciao okay